Good morning, uh, and thank you for um, being with us uh, to take part in our uh, weekly City of Toledo uh, news briefing. Um, again, this is we're using the Zoom uh, webinar uh, service, uh, and there are American Sign Language interpreters with us. Um, members of the media, if you could uh, stay uh, muted until we have time, until we get to the uh, part for questions, and then I know there's a function to digitally raise your hand, uh, and then we will recognize you uh, as we go forward. A couple updates uh, today, uh, two general topics I want to touch on, um, but uh, before we get uh, to those two general topics, um, I, I just want to update uh, some statistics. Um, there uh, have now been 1,217 COVID-19 cases in Lucas County, uh, 104 deaths. Um, this can, continues to be a, um, a, a real challenge for our community and for communities across the country. I know we're at a really interesting time here uh, with tomorrow being the date that uh, the state and the economy in some ways uh, begins to open back up. And that's one of the two topics I do wanna, uh, wanna hit on. Um, so uh, it's gonna be doubly important for us uh, to remain vigilant and guard against the natural human instinct to think that this is over and we can go back to normal and that everything is, uh, you know, is that the crisis has passed. Um, that's not the case. And in some ways, this is uh, the most important time uh, to adhere to the restrictions that are still in place um, because we don't want to see a uh, a second spike or a second growth uh, in cases or deaths as they've seen in other countries who after an initial period of success took their foot off the gas a little bit, maybe started taking it a little less seriously than they should and then boom, they were right back uh, to where they were. Opening today's news conference with um, a reminder that you know 1,200 people in our community have uh, come down with this virus and over 100 have died from it, I think is a good reminder uh, that this continues to be very real uh, for people in our community. There are so many people who need to be thanked and deserve to be thanked for uh, the response that our community uh, has shown uh, to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, at the risk of you know, leaving someone out, um, I, I do wanna highlight um, Yark Automotive Group uh, today, uh, they um, they were contacted several weeks ago, and they've offered their disinfectant services for all of our fire rigs. Uh, and as of yesterday, uh, they had dis disinfected 60 fire rigs for the city of Toledo. Uh, so Yark Automotive Group uh, deserves a tip of the cap and and a thank you. Um, and they now join, and they've been doing this all along, but they join a long list of corporate partners uh, that have stepped up to uh, volunteer, to donate, frankly, to get creative uh, during very difficult times. Um, and it's an indication of the sort of community we have. Um, individual citizens have been doing this also. And even at a time of great uncertainty uh, and difficulty, uh, it is a, um, it's a wonderful reminder that there's a lot of goodness about us and goodness in our community. And I hope that that is among the lessons that people take uh, from this uh, from this time that we're going through. So the Arc Automotive Group disinfected 60 fire rigs for us as of yesterday. We couldn't be more thankful uh, to them. Uh, police and fire department themselves continue to put themselves in harm's way and to step up in difficult times. And there's nothing uh, we could ever do to thank them enough. Uh, for their service to our community. I want to remind people that today, April 30th, uh, at Metro Parks Hawkins Farmhouse, uh, which is at 5434 West Bancroft, uh, that code, uh, COVID-19 testing continues in uh, that uh, uh, site, which is supported by Walmart, uh, Quest Diagnostics, and the Health Department, the county and the city. Uh, that, um, I think we saw uh, 
we see what we see now is Walmart kind of come online uh, as Kroger Kroger's contribution to our testing efforts um, has ended uh, as as was part of the plan and now Walmart has stepped in uh, to replace Kroger in fact in the very same location so uh, the more robust testing that we're seeing in the community continues um, and want to highlight that today is uh, the day essentially that Walmart is taking over that site so that people will have access to the testing that they need to feel comfortable that we can go back uh, to something resembling normal. Um, that is a good segue to the first of two topics that I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about today, and that is going back to normal. Um, this was an exciting week. I think it was uh, an eventful week and it was uh, a week a lot of people were looking forward to because this was the week that Governor DeWine um, announced on Monday his plan to slowly reopen uh, Ohio. I think the emphasis should be on the word slowly. My sense is that there might have been some surprise um, at how little uh, is opening tomorrow um, or frankly how little will still be open even maybe a month from now. Uh, restaurants, um, health uh, not health facilities, but uh, gyms, where uh, you tend to your health by uh, working out. Um, uh, hair salons, uh, bars and taverns. Not only are they not uh, opening tomorrow, the governor still hasn't even established a timeline for when they may open. Now we think that that could be uh, end of May, early June, but it's an indication of how slowly this is going to happen. Um, that those things still don't even have a date, uh, a firm date for when they may open. But some things are going to start opening as soon as tomorrow. And um, elective medical procedures and surgeries not requiring an overnight stay are among those very first things that will come back online tomorrow, May 1st. Um, regular doctor's appointments, uh, going to your dentist, uh, getting a checkup with your cardiologist or whatever, you know, whatever health need you have, those things can start happening tomorrow. You can take your pet to the vet starting tomorrow. So we are gonna see a slow, again, slow uh, re-engagement of uh, the economy and of society. Uh, Monday, May 4th, um, general offices are gonna come back online. I'm, I'm here at the mayor's office, as you know, and I've my pattern uh, really has been, I'm, I'm probably here most days. In fact, I know I am here most days. Um, I think next week we will start to see uh, more people back in our building, not, not talking about opening it back up as if nothing had ever happened, but slowly but surely, I think we're gonna have more um, uh, folks, certainly up here in the mayor's office and throughout the building. I talked to um, uh, some ProMedica officials yesterday. Uh, they indicated that they are going to in, in waves and in stages, slowly start uh, coming back on Monday, May 4th, uh, as part of the opening of general office work. So I think you're gonna see uh, that. Distribution centers, manufacturing, construction uh, companies um, are also gonna come online May 4th. But again, um, if staying at home and working at home uh, is going to be required for those who don't fall into uh, any one of those categories. Not, again, not only um, is there no date for the lifting of restriction on bars, taverns, restaurants, uh, uh, gyms, hair salons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's no date yet established for the lifting of the stay at home order. Uh, the governor has still kept the stay at home in order in place, which means that um, with some exceptions, the exceptions we're talking about now and the exceptions that he announced on Monday, it is still the case that you should remain at home. And that, that hasn't changed at all. Um, we are, I think we're lucky in Ohio that our curve has flattened more so than most states around us, but that is because we have been so vigilant and we've got a governor that has been frankly so tough <laughs> uh, and, uh, and strong on this. And you need only look at the states around us and see some of their numbers and uh, begin to appreciate that the reason we're not going through maybe the same level of crisis in Ohio is because of the steps that were taken. But if we take our foot off the gas, 
Um, we're going to be just like all these other countries in the world if they took their foot off the gas, only to have a second spike. We certainly don't want that to happen. And that is why, again, large gatherings of people, um, downtown events, fireworks, uh, baseball games, concerts. Uh, you know, the governor hasn't made this announcement yet. I would be very surprised if we see those sorts of things uh, anytime soon, maybe even for the rest of this calendar year. I mean, so we are a long ways away from truly getting back to where we want to be, but slow steps are occurring. And then the big one in his announcement, and this is the one I just want to spend a little bit of time on in terms of what it means for the, for the local response, um, is May 12th. I think that's a date that many people have circled on their calendars um, as a significant date in that retail will come back online. And so that retail stores and customer service businesses um, are going to uh, be open on May 12th. But even, um, uh, even there, there are still going to need to be some restrictions and we are still going to have to uh, understand that social distancing is going to be reality for us for an awful long time. The governor um, sort of, uh, he initially said uh, that on May 12th, when retail opens, that he would require or mandate that people wear a face covering. And then uh, the next day, I think he, um, I don't want to say backtracked, but um, I think his position evolved. Uh, on that uh, issue. And so while it's not, uh, he's not something that he is mandating, uh, it is certainly something that is uh, required, that, that uh, he recommends and Center for Disease Control recommends, and it is good practice. Um, it is the case that businesses um, who choose to do so could prevent citizens from entering their place of business uh, if they are not wearing a face covering. Now, that's not a, an order from the governor. That's not a, a, a official rule or regulation. It is the discretion that a business owner would always have. Business owner always has uh, certain uh, parameters with which he or she can operate his business. And so we may find, starting May 12th, that there are some business owners uh, who are concerned enough about their employees themselves and their customers that they will not allow you into their business uh, to conduct commerce if you're not wearing a face covering. Um, that is always a possibility. It's unknowable which businesses may do that or might not do it, but citizens should expect that while face coverings are not required uh, legally uh, for retail on May 12th, there could be situations where business owners require it uh, and they are within their rights to require it. Um, and I want to make that point as well. The final thing I want to say on the governor's orders before I move to the second and final topic I want to hit on today is that there's been a lot of talk about the local response to the governor's orders. Again, we are, uh, this has evolved in, in such an unusual way in our country. I think I've said this before, but there hasn't really so much been one national response to the COVID-19 crisis as much as there has been 50 different state responses. And so cities like Toledo have been in a situation of having to adapt and evolve and align themselves with their governor in their states. And it's no different here. Um, it, that was some, that was easy, it was tough, but that was easier to do when things were being closed down. It is going to be tougher uh, to do as things start to open up. The, in, the enforcement part of that is going to be much more difficult. It's easy to enforce uh, sort of, you know, a, a blanket order that says people should stay in their homes. That's pretty easy. If you see a bunch of people congregating, the police can ask them to disperse or, or issue a citation or, or, or worse. But it's going to be much tougher to enforce the gradual loosening of restrictions. Well, okay, this retail business is open, but are they adhering to their proper requirements? Oh, geez, I don't know. How do we, you know, that is going to fall on uh, lo localities to enforce that. It's going to be much tougher. So the question um, has arisen uh, about whether or not the city of Toledo will impose its own additional 
uh, restrictions um, on our city, or if restrictions is maybe too harsh a word, if the city of Toledo will um, uh, uh, maybe establish its own guidelines, maybe that's a, a better way of saying it. In other words, regardless of what the governor has done and the general parameters of what the governor has announced, beyond that, are there things that the city of Toledo as its own unique uh, you know, uh, legal entity might do to further protect the health and welfare of the citizens? We have always been open-minded uh, to, uh, to pursuing these options. There was a conversation a couple of weeks ago about whether a curfew, a local curfew would be something that would make sense. We remain open-minded to that, but we still think that the governor's orders um, are more all-encompassing than any local order would be. But along those lines, along those lines of local enforcement, local guidelines, local regulations uh, that may layer on top of or alongside of the governor's orders, um, I can tell you that uh, uh, along with the health department, uh, that we are studying and considering whether there should be um, local guidelines to supplement the governor's orders. If May 12th is that big day that we're circling on the calendar, the big retail moment where people may really start to get out and about, um, then it strikes us that if we are going to impose local rules, uh, that we're going to have to do that within the next week. So. Um, I uh, had a long conversation with the health department yesterday. Um, I think we, Eric and I, are um, aligned in our thinking uh, that uh, additional local guidelines or clarification uh, could be helpful uh, to our citizens as they understand what they can and can't do starting uh, May 12th. And so while I have nothing to announce today, and frankly, it'll probably be more of an announcement that the health department would make or maybe we would make it jointly. Um, I can't announce today specifically what those things may be. Um, I can say that by next week, probably by the middle of next week, um, and this would be maybe Wednesday, Thursday of next week, I think it is very likely that you would see the health department um, in concert with the city um, announcing perhaps a small handful of additional uh, uh, guidance uh, that would go hand in hand with the governor's orders uh, to help um, Toledo citizens understand the rules and to further uh, guard the safety and welfare of Toledoans. Uh, talked to the governor the other day and, and we, as we talked about his order um, and questions were raised about, uh, well, what about A, B, and C? What about X, Y, and Z? Um, various mayors asked those questions. Governor made a very clear point, and he's right. Localities are always free to uh, add on or to supplement uh, or to uh, enhance his orders. Um, it's very clear that localities have the ability to do that. And so the health department and the city are developing uh, a strategy that may well include a small handful of such guidelines. Um, you know, these would be things, again, I'm not saying that that's, this is what they would be, but potentially among the things that we would consider uh, would be requiring, uh, you know, perhaps requiring signage uh, at a uh, retail store, um, uh, alerting customers of the uh, various rules within. And maybe those rules would be the need for social distancing throughout the store at all times, not just when you are in line at the cash register ordering. You know, maybe, maybe that, that is the sort of thing that we're thinking about. Um, uh, perhaps um, requiring that uh, there are special uh, times for seniors uh, to be able to engage in retail at that store. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, limitations on the numbers of people who could be in a store at, at one time, or uh, perhaps limitations on the number of family members that could come in and shop. So, you know, you got a car of uh, five people that goes to a retail store, maybe all five of them aren't gonna be able to go in and shop, you know, maybe a smaller percentage of them might. 
anyhow, I, I, I just threw out three or four of those. Um, and uh, the, again, it's not to say that those are uh, the guide, guidelines that the health department is going to embrace. It's not to say that they aren't, but it's those types of things that um, the health department uh, is going to consider that those, those types of things that Eric and I talked about yesterday. Um, and I do think that by mid next week, um, we are likely to see, um, you know, maybe a small handful of local add-ons uh, to whatever the state may be requiring. So I just want to kind of give that heads up. No, no announcement today as to what they may be or if they will even be any, but it's something that we're talking about and it's, you know, it's my sense that by mid next week, there may be a, uh, there may be a small handful of things like the things I listed, not, not necessarily perhaps literally exactly the things I listed, but those sorts of, uh, uh, you know, kind of to put sort of a local imprint uh, on the governor's order. So I just want to make sure the media is aware that before we head into May 12th, which is a really important day in the history of this uh, crisis, at least for us locally, um, that, you know, about a week before May 12th, um, th there may well be some local uh, guidance, guidelines that would supplement the governor's order. Secondly, and finally, final thing I want to touch on before we get into questions um, is the election uh, that uh, just concluded this week uh, and, the, uh, and the impact on Toledo as it pertains to uh, issue one. First thing I have to say is that I owe Melissa Veitch a coffee. Uh, I'm not even sure if she's joining us uh, today. I don't know who uh, I think I'm told she is. If uh, the thumbs up I'm getting from Ignacio is an indication that she's joining us. Melissa, I owe you a coffee. I think Sarah Elms uh, said to me, and another thumbs up, I'm, so that means Sarah is with us. I think Sarah uh, said to me a couple of days ago, I didn't even know, I don't even think you drink coffee. In fact, I don't drink coffee. <laughs> so uh, uh, I don't have a lot of expertise uh, in terms of uh, what, uh, uh, of how I should settle this wager. So um, whatever you, you know, give me a recommendation, tell me what to, tell me what you want, to, what size, what kind of, uh, what kind of goodies <laughs> you want with it. And, and we will square that up next time I see or you know, next time the opportunity uh, presents itself. So, um, uh, so I, I need to do that. And I need to also uh, let, let uh, the public know, uh, you know, what, where we go from here. Uh, I have to say it was a really interesting election. It was an election, that's not a cliche. It was something I don't think any one of us had ever seen before. <laughs> um, it, there was, it was almost like two elections. There was the election leading up to March 17th. And March 17th is an important date because that was the date that they were supposed to, the Ohio primary was, was supposed to take place. They were supposed to conclude. Um, so there was the election before March 17th. And then given the circumstances that unfolded, there was the election after. March 17th, that concluded this past uh, Tuesday. Um, what we know now um, is that uh, the voters who voted before March 17th uh, uh, reacted to issue one very differently <laughs> than the voters who voted uh, after March 17th. And it's very understandable, understandable what happened. So in other words, if you look at the math, and I know this is a little, maybe this is a little, uh, math nerdy, this might be a little geeky, but the way this works is especially for an election that as it turns out was almost exclusively an absentee ballot or early vote election. Um, because it was that type of election, uh, the Board of Elections all throughout just about every day, but sometimes it might have been uh, you know, every other day, releases a list of the names of people who vote and the addresses of people who vote. That's public record and campaigns always sort of consume that information and then try to communicate with those voters. Obviously, you know, no one knows exactly how people vote. That's part of what's special and uh, precious about our democratic system, but we know who voted and what their address was. That was fine up until uh, April 28th. But then on April 28th, once the results all start to come in, and once you then can look at the ward and precinct breakdowns and who voted, uh, you know, which neighborhoods voted which way, then, although it is a bit of a math project, 
you can sort of layer that information together. How did neighborhoods vote? Who voted? Where they lived? And and what you and and you know when because the board was releasing it um, about every other day. So um, with the benefit of a couple hours to crunch these numbers, and it's not again, you know, it's not a perfect uh, mathematical uh, analysis, but you know, generally given you know the algorithms that you can build. It's pretty, it's look, it, it's not, this is not my opinion. <laughs> it is a mathematical certainty that essentially the people who voted before March 17th generally supported issue one. In fact, it was about, you know, about two to one. There were 10,000 such voters. Those 10,000 voters supported issue one about two to one. But the, but there were 15,000 voters who voted after March 17th. And those 15,000 voters opposed issue one by about two to one. Again, these we're talking about rough estimates here, but that's generally how it turned out. When you put those together, 10,000 people supporting it two to one, 15,000 people opposing it two to one, and you mix all those numbers together, you get the result pretty close to what we have, which is um, you know, a close but, but certain uh, defeat for issue one. There were more people who were against it uh, than were for it. But it was just so, it was just and for sort of a elections geek like myself, it was just so interesting to see truly two separate elections. You know, an election that would have taken place on March 17th as, you know, for nine months, we assumed it would, issue one was gonna pass. Um, and that's because, uh, you know, people wanted to fix their roads. People uh, wanted to make those investments in their city. And that's, you know, that's understandable. I, I agree, we, we wanted to do that too. But I also agree that the world changed <laughs> right around March 17th. Um, when those first 10,000 votes were cast, uh, you know, Toledo had, uh, you know, three, four percent unemployment. The economy was strong. We um, had a budget surplus, uh, and it was just a different world. I, I don't blame at all a, a voter uh, post March 17th who, uh, you know, became concerned about um, how his or her tax money might be spent. Um, it makes all the sense of the world because after March 17th, the economy collapsed, the, uh, the stock market tanked, people lost their 401ks, people lost their jobs, people are being laid off, there's economic uh, uncertainty and it makes all, it's not surprising at all. And, and we absolutely in this, uh, in public life, we respect the, um, the voters are always right. That's one of the truisms of, uh, of democracy. The voters are always right. So in terms of analyzing it, uh, it's really interesting. It's pretty clear that before March 17th, you know, they, they, they wanted us to fix their roads and invest in their parks and uh, you know, help educate our children and all the things that we wanted to do. And it's, I don't know that it would be fair to say that they no longer want those things to happen, but they understandably were concerned that given what's going on with the economy, you know, maybe, uh, maybe priorities have changed. And that, that, that is fair and understandable. So the world has changed. Um, and I know there are, well, in anticipation of questions you may have, there are gonna be people who say, well, uh, it failed because of, uh, uh, you know, failed because of the part for pre-K or it failed, you know, there were some people, uh, the passage of issue one was also going to grow our police department. We're gonna have a force of about 700 officers by 2023. There were some people who didn't like that, actually. Uh, some people feel like we have too many police officers. So there are going to be those um, who say, well, no, 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 the reason issue one failed was because you know, of all the extra things you wanted to do, pre-K and more police. That's a fair point. But all those things were in issue one on March 17th when issue one was gonna pass two to one. <laughs> so it wasn't really what was in, uh, it wasn't so much the, the menu of proposals not everyone supported them, of course. No vote is unanimous, but enough people uh, supported it that uh, you know it was it was something that that was going to happen until the world changed. And when the world changed, priorities changed. Hey, and that's that's okay. And so now, now that it's all shaken out, regardless of why or how or who or when, 
fact of the matter is, even for things that we know the citizens want, citizens want to fix their roads, but citizens are still worried about their future. They, they you know, this might have been a relatively small amount of money per paycheck that would have funded these things. What happens if you're not getting a paycheck anymore? I mean, the, the world has changed. We are in, we went from a strong growing economy to a recession in three weeks. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to know um, what people, it's just hard to know um, what people value at a moment like this. I don't think anyone knows. Um, so what we do is we go forward and think about the best way um, to meet the citizens where they are. That's the job of democracy is to listen. And that's really the job that we have going forward now is we need to listen. What are the voters telling us? Um, if the economy did totally change the dynamic, it's, it obviously did. What does that mean? What guidance does that give us? What do they want us to do then for, uh, for November? Well, obviously, um, we're going to need to put something on the ballot uh, this fall, probably November. Um, but we're going to have to put something on the ballot. Um, we will at least have to renew the three-quarter percent, which expires at the end of December. I, 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 you know, I don't even, perhaps there are people who would debate even that. Perhaps there are people who would oppose even that. I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say that I think most people understand that we need three-quarter percent uh, to survive as a city. I, I don't know how else to say it. So at the very um, least, we're going to uh, need to renew the three-quarter percent. And so I think you will see something like that on the ballot uh, relative, you know, sometime before the end of the year, probably November. The question then becomes, is that all that we do? Do we merely just renew it and move on and just try to you know, limp along and survive the best we can. Okay, maybe that is the mood uh, that the voters are in now because of the economic calamity. Or is there a sense that the voters could stomach more? Um, and if they could stomach more, what form does that take? Does that, does it take the form of one issue on the ballot, the renewal plus something else? Or does it take the form maybe of two issues? So maybe you have a straight renewal in November, and then a totally separate issue for something else. And then what is the something else? Maybe it's just roads. You know, maybe, um, and I know what, uh, I, I know sometimes the knock against me is that I am, uh, my dreams are too big and that I love Toledo too much and that I want big things and, and we're gonna do daring uh, programs and we're gonna, you know, become, uh, all that we can be, and guilty as charged. I do, I do want big things for the city, and I do think we can accomplish big things for the city. And I'm never going to apologize for wanting to do great things for this city. I said when I was elected, and I'll say it again: um, we're going to try things. We're going to try things. Um, they're not all going to work. Some of them are going to work. Regional water, developing Southwick. I mean, those were some, you know, those were some pretty big successes that uh, eluded. Uh, previous city governments, but some things aren't going to work. And this election, you know, the, no one could foresee the collapse of the economy, but it happened. And you know what we do? We learn from it, pick ourselves up off the ground, dust ourselves off and try something else. We're going to keep throwing things up at the wall um, because um, Toledo deserves effort and energy uh, from its city government. We're, we're not just going to sit around uh, and twiddle our thumbs and watch the world pass. We're going to be active and aggressive and bold. But maybe, given the time that we're in, my inclination toward boldness and big things and uh, steering Toledo toward uh, all it can be, maybe there's not as much appetite for that now because people are worried uh, uh, about the economy. That's fair. That's fair. And that, um, that, is, uh, that is something that we need to factor in uh, to the decisions we make going forward. So let's say we do separate it into two different issues. Um, first of all, maybe there's no appetite for anything beyond the renewal, but maybe there is. Maybe though it should just be for roads. Maybe we, you know, uh, in my enthusiasm for turning this into a 
a stronger city that we threw too many goodies uh, in the uh, uh, in in the mix. Okay, maybe it's just roads, or maybe it's just parks, or maybe it's a who knows. Maybe it's not a full half a percent. Maybe it's a quarter percent. A quarter percent just for roads plus a renewal. Who knows? I don't know. Um, but I do know that the job of all of us is to listen. And so uh, I don't think it's, uh, not, again, it's not a question of thinking. There's math now that supports me. The voters didn't reject the ideas. They supported the ideas, almost two to one. They, reject, they, they rejected the, uh, the, time in, the time in which the programs were being proposed. And the time changed. You know, the campaign that began, uh, it began at a, at a different time than what it ended. So um, I know the citizens want their roads fixed. I know they want to invest in themselves. But this just might not be the time to do it. This, we might be at a time of economic uncertainty uh, where citizens just want to renew that three quarter percent and let's take it a day at a time. So the, the, that's where things are. I don't know how to be any more honest than that. So what I'm going to do right now, we need to listen. We need to listen to citizens, help them guide us uh, toward um, our next steps, uh, understanding that the economy has changed everything. Um, so I'm going to reach out to members of city council to get their advice and guidance, um, regardless of what we put on the ballot, the citizen or the city council is going to have to be a part of that. So right now, um, we're going to take a period of time, I don't know, days, weeks, uh, consult with city council. I, I'm really going to be seeking each one of their opinions on, you know, the right way forward. You know, what, what do we do? Uh, is it, again, is it just a, the renewal of the three quarter percent? Do we try to do some other things? If so, what, what amount? All of it, it's all on the table. And, uh, We'll be, we'll be fine. You know, this is, this really is, I know there's some people who really take this personally, but this is, this is how democracy works. It's okay. This is a healthy, wonderful way to make decisions. And it's a heck of a lot better way to do it than to do in a lot of other parts of the world where they make decisions with guns and tanks and things like that. It's okay. We're, we're going to listen and um, make a smart, thoughtful decision on where we go from here. So with that, I know that was a little long-winded, but I wanted to touch on those two larger issues, especially the possibility of some local uh, guidance on the governor's uh, health orders, uh, give some general updates, and then now I think just open it up for questions. Looks like there are maybe two questions. Mayor, the first question comes from Sean Haggerty, channel 13. Sean? Yes, Mayor, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I just wanna make sure that we're totally clear here. So do you believe that viewers, or I'm sorry, do you believe voters said no to issue one because of the substance or because of COVID-19? Oh, there's no question, it's COVID-19. That, that's not, and, and here's the thing, it's not my opinion it, that this is now a mathematical fact. There's no question. The, the, an election that would have ended on March 17th, uh, issue one would have passed, you know, if not two to one, you know, probably 59, 41, something like that. I mean, it's, it's math. It's not my opinion, but it, you know, life, it's okay, life changes. And hey, COVID-19 was not a, uh, it's not a small change. It destroyed the economy. It uh, has destroyed our lives in a lot of ways. It has sadly ended a hundred lives in our community. So um, there's no doubt. I mean, no, no, there's no, I don't even, that, that's not an opinion. That's, that's just what the numbers indicate. But, you know, the past is the past. And the fact is the world changed and COVID-19 has changed people's uh, appetites and views. Even for things that they like. Um, they want road uh, repair, obviously. But now, you know, budgets are tighter. So it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't really doesn't matter, but that's the reality. Now we're living in a recession. That's where we are. That's, and that's not an opinion either, by the way. Um, recession is a okay. just like it is a mathematically the case that you know this issue one was going to pass on March 17th. It's also a mathematical okay. case that we are on that we're in a recession. Uh, recession is two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. That's where we are. And so, uh, in a recession, voters value different things than they do during times of growth. That's that's common sense. It's okay. 
So but let me ask you. But let me ask you this: you you can't you can't know what was in the mind of voters that were going to come out on the seventeenth. You could have had a huge swath of people coming out on the seventeenth that were no's that would have that would have shot this down. You can't know that, right? This okay. Sure, I, I understand. I do understand your point. I also know what the numbers indicate, and the um, how about this? The numbers are so overwhelming uh, that I feel very safe in saying that um, issue one would have passed on March seventeenth. It's the reason that on a presidential election, the networks can call uh, they can call a state when one percent of the vote is in. Well, technically, the other 99% uh, might end up voting for Biden. No, no, we know Oklahoma's going to vote for Trump. It doesn't matter if only 1% has it. Yes, I know. Other people would have voted on election day. But when you look at those people who did vote and who they were and where they lived, it, it, does, it doesn't matter. I, who cares? Fine. It, it just doesn't matter. It's not important anymore. It, you know, it, it failed. We're going to move on. But just like the networks can call Vermont when 10 votes are in, and there's still hundreds of thousands more to vote. I think people who understand elect, how about this? People who understand elections know what happened, but it's okay. It, it, people have different opinions. It just, this just doesn't matter anymore. So it doesn't matter because now we live in a world where the economy has collapsed and that's the only world, world that matters. Okay, the next question is from Eric from Channel 11. Eric. Hey, Mayor, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just a quick question. Um, with people kind of going back to work now, um, mm -hmm. do you have a message for all of the essential workers who have kind of kept Toledo running? The message is thank you. Um, and you know, I know this might sound trite, uh, but you you are heroes. Um, you you have done something that is heroic. Um, those firefighters, police officers health officials, uh, you know, nurses, doctors, folks who work at grocery stores, you know, you might, you know, typically you might not think of, you know, someone who works at Kroger uh, as a hero in the same way as a firefighter. I'll tell you what, in these last six weeks, I think they are right there shoulder to shoulder. Uh, knowing every day that when they go to work, they are putting themselves at risk. They are um, putting themselves in line to get sick, uh, to get their loved ones sick and they keep showing up from, for work doing their job. Um, so I say thank you. Um, and I encourage all Toledoans as we slowly re-enter a more open economy and more open society to keep, keep those folks in mind and, uh, and to thank them. Because you know, when everyone else was you know, at home uh, you know, watching TV, they were out there uh, volunteering uh, to put themselves in harm's way for you. And that's, that's what I would say to them. Mayor, the next question comes from Bree from WNWO. Okay. Bree? Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, Mayor, how are you? Um, I was just wondering, so I know that you were giving just general ideas of what the city of Toledo guidelines could be in addition to the governor's. Um, I guess, could you talk a little bit more about how that would be regulated and would this be required? You know, you said, as an example, I know you said signs outside of businesses. Would all businesses have to have that? And just kind of give a, a little more insight into that if you could. Well, like I mentioned, the, um, the enforcement side of this is going to be really tough. I mean, it's going to be really tough. Um, this, what we're doing now, or what we're going to start doing, um, you know, here in May, is a lot easier than enforcing the shutdown. Enforcing the reopening is going to be a lot tougher. And we're not going to get it right, and it's not going to be perfect, but nothing about the situation we're in is perfect. So, again, and I don't want to, I believe that mid-next week, the health department is going to come out with, again, it's not going to be 50 different rules, but there might be a small handful of things. And I think they are likely uh, to embrace standards that are easily enforceable. At the end of the day, while our police department certainly plays a role in enforcement and sheriff's deputies play a role in enforcement, um, it's primarily the health department. So the health department is not going to embrace a set of rules that they themselves can't enforce. So I would keep that in mind, but I might say this, let's say, 
and again, this is, I don't even want to say that, uh, this, this is just an example of something that might, might be a local standard. Let's say that the health department decides to establish a rule for retail, that social distancing has to be in place all throughout the store at all times, not only when we're squeezed together in the queue uh, near the checkout counter. I think, you know, I think everyone would understand that, you know, we need social distancing when we're there, trying not to read what the is in the National Enquirer. Um, but there are some communities that are trying to take that a little further and say, okay, well, we also don't want people squeezed in next to each other out in the aisles fighting for cereal or you know, whatever it may be. And that's a bad example because grocery stores have always been open. Um, so if that is one of uh, the standards, you know, it's not going to be easy to enforce. It's not going to be perfect, but I think you can imagine that it'll be, a, that is something that you can sort of eyeball a little better. I think that would be something where citizens who see it being violated could complain and that would be enforced, frankly, in the same way that all of the enforcement has happened over the last month. We've gotten a lot of complaints. This business is not complying and this, this is not essential and they should be closed and yet it's open. Well, in an imperfect, inefficient way, we've had to go out and enforce those things too. Um, but once we have gotten on site, and they made a judgment like, oh no, this business was allowed to be open or no, it's not allowed to be. Remember Hobby Lobby, that was a case where they, there were complaints and then in fact that they, they did have, they did close. I think the opposite is also true. Or if that, if that is one of those rules, we get a sense that uh, there are retail stores that are looking the other way as people jam together in the aisles. My sense is we'll get complaints about that. And then just as we did on the early part of this crisis, on the back end of it, you know, we'll send enforcement folks out there and just like with anything else, if there will always, if, if your goal is to try to find a way uh, to not do something, you know, you'll, I'm sure you'll figure out a way. If your goal is to try to game this, if you, if you want to game the system at all costs, people are pretty creative. I'm, I'm sure they can figure out how to do it. But most people uh, want this to work for all of us. Most people want the economy to work, want society to work. And so while it's not going to be perfect, I think that this is something that can be, you know, a combination of self-policed and, if necessary, you know, health department officials can come and make sure that their orders are being adhered to. Mayor, the next question is from Sarah Elms at The Blade. Sarah? Okay. Hi, Mayor. Thanks for your time. Um, you talked about the economic collapse a couple times here, uh, and I'm wondering how soon you anticipate more budget cuts um, for the city of Toledo. I mean, I know there's some employees out right now, but when are more cuts coming? Um, we have a meeting today at noon that's going to review the budget. Um, we have another meeting Monday where we're going to review the budget. We're talking to city council uh, next week on two different occasions. Um, you know, this is a fluid evolving situation. You know, we're obviously going to reevaluate every 30 days. Um, there's nothing that I can tell you, there's nothing imminent. There's no, uh, there's nothing we're on the, there's no cut that we are uh, on the verge of announcing or that we are, that we anticipate is going to happen here anytime in the foreseeable future. Though I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. I think it is reasonable to assume uh, that there will be more cuts until the economy starts turning around, until um, there is reimbursement uh, relief from the state or federal government. Um, so look, those conversations are ongoing. They continue. There are meetings every day about it, but there is nothing imminent right now, but that could change next week. That could change next hour. <laughs> you know, this is, no one's ever been through anything like this. Um, so right now, we don't, there are, we have nothing is imminent, no additional cuts right now, but I, I'm sure you don't know exactly what the world is going to look like next week and neither do we, you know, the, when I say things change on the hour, you know, about a, when it's probably nine days ago when Congress was passing the, what turned out to be the CARES 3.5, you know, we had U.S. senators calling us saying, 
all right, we, uh, we did it. We finally went back and got uh, Treasury, Department of Treasury, to allow money from CARES 3.0 to be able to be used for reimbursement. In other words, should cities and states uh, be able to use CARES Act money uh, um, to merely reimburse COVID-19 related costs, or could those monies be used to replace lost revenue? The, we had a couple of senators say, we did it. You know, it's, it's, the, we, uh, it's gonna be in this compromise, it's gonna be in this bill, you'll be able to use your CARES Act money for revenue replacement. Um, I don't know, half an hour later, oh boy, that's a, it's odd. <laughs> the, the deal went down the toilet, and now again, you can only use CARES Act money for uh, COVID-19 related reimbursements. So it changes every hour. And I, by the way, I believe that will probably change back. And I do believe before this is all said and done uh, that um, we will probably have the flexibility to use CARES Act money uh, for revenue replacement, not just reimbursement. But as of this moment in time, it can only be reimbursement. And what, why does that matter? Well, we, um, you know, ever since this started, we have been counting everything, um, making notes of every expense and, and you know, how much has been going to you know, COVID-19 related expenses. You know, we think best guess that so far, you know, there's about a million dollars, roughly, roughly a million dollars of uh, expense that the city has incurred that is directly due to COVID-19 response. You know, so there's overtime for uh, first responders and things like that, you know, equipment, uh, the masks, and, you know, the things that, uh, costs that were incurred literally due to responding to COVID-19. Well, as of now, um, the reimbursement from the, the CARES Act can only go to cover those costs. And if that's what it turns out to be, heck, we'll take it. It's about a million dollars. Um, but as I think everyone here knows by now, <laughs> that uh, what has happened to cities in the country isn't just merely that they incurred expenses that they weren't forecasting six weeks ago. Their revenues disappeared. 71% of all the revenues uh, that support the city of Toledo come from an income tax. And that's the same, uh, the same is true for all cities in Ohio. And when the president of the United States and your governor literally orders you to stay home and not make an income, that's gonna have an impact on your bottom line. Um, so uh, a million dollar reimbursement for the overtime and the equipment and, and you know, other services we need to directly respond to this crisis is great, but I might make the argument that the COVID-19 crisis has really cost us, you know the numbers, 20, 30, 40, maybe $50 million. We need Congress to interpret what has happened here uh, in such a way that we can replace those lost revenues. Right now, they're only interpreting it to cover direct reimbursements. So it's a fine point, but it's real. And we fight for that every day with our elected representatives. And it's why this is such a fluid situation. So that's a very long answer, but it, um, you know, we have nothing to announce today and I don't I doubt we'll have anything to announce uh, next week, um, but this changes every day. And, you know, if without, um, you know, without a change in how Congress is uh, interpreting uh, certain formulas, we probably will get to the point where we're going to have to make uh, additional cuts, but we're not there right now. Mayor, we have one more question from Sean Haggerty again, that's Channel 13. Sean? Hi, Mayor. Two pieces on going forward. One, uh, summer events, things like fireworks. Do you anticipate us seeing the fireworks? And secondly, if you do decide on some sort of plan for the income tax for November, what is your schedule looking like for when you want to finalize plans, when you announce it, when you make a decision on what you want to do? Yeah. Um, the, on the first question, I, we have no announcement to make today um, about, for instance, fireworks. Um, it's possible that an announcement like that could happen next week. That even that might be a little too soon. But here's sometime in the next two-ish weeks or so, 
and there's a technical phrase for you, two-ish weeks. But for some time, sometime in the next couple weeks, I do think there will be a formal announcement um, on fireworks. The reason I, I am, uh, the reason I, I can't say anything more declaratively is that, you know, we do have partners in this that we have to consult with, <clears throat> you know, sponsors, uh, you know, what's ProMedica or Owens Corning or, you know, so many different groups sponsor and then uh, um, Destination Toledo and, and others are all part of putting the event on. And we knew it's not, I can't, I don't want to announce anything before we've had the opportunity to collaborate and have this conversation with them. I, I will say, I, I would be surprised if there were um, downtown fireworks this year. I would be surprised. Maybe, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope we somehow catch lightning in a bottle and the world changes here in the next couple of weeks uh, in a way that um, would make my prediction inaccurate. Uh, but right now, I, I just would be very, very surprised knowing uh, the governor's thoughts on this, knowing that here, I mean, look, basically, uh, at least until June 1st, uh, the governor is keeping his stay at home order in place and preventing gatherings of more than 10 people. That's, that's the governor's order up until June 1st. I just can't imagine that 30 days later, July 1st, July 4th, that he's gonna say, oh, okay, you can have 50,000 people downtown watching fireworks. It's just hard for me to imagine that the governor would make that kind of a change in such a short amount of time. I just, I just don't see it. I want fireworks, but and maybe somehow there could be a way that there are fireworks without the gathering of tens of thousands of people. It's just hard for me to see that happening. So it's not an official announcement, but that is that is among the things that I just can't imagine happening this year. On the second question uh, on issue one, I think the most, or I guess it's not issue one anymore, but the, the uh, November and what we're going to do, whether it's a you know renewal or something else. Um, there's two instincts that are driving us. Uh, one is th there's a, a need to, to resolve this relatively quickly uh, so that we can, you know, develop a plan and, you know, uh, start making assumptions based around it. Um, and that argues for sort of a quick decision. But I am one who believes that right now the most important thing that we can do is to pause and listen and, uh, and understand what the voters want to do. Um, what has this economic uh, calamity done to the values of Toledo voters? And we can all guess and we could all theorize, um, but I, I, I want to make sure that we are taking the time to, to truly listen. So um, if there was ever a time <laughs> for uh, good, positive, constructive um, engagement from the citizens, um, let's hear it, you know, emails, calls uh, uh, to not just the mayor's office, but city council, I think would be very helpful. Uh, listening is important. One of the things, again, one of the things I heard from the campaign is, ah, you shouldn't have mushed everything together. You shouldn't have put it all in one big package. Okay, yeah, maybe hindsight's always 20, 20. Maybe, maybe we should, you know, maybe uh, in November, we should separate this out. Renewal and then a standalone roads only quarter percent. Who knows? But maybe the appetite of the citizenry and the economy has changed so much that they don't even want to do roads. That they're, we'll take potholes, we're happy with potholes, we just can't afford to pay anything else right now. Okay, we need to hear that, truly. Um, so I want to, and I, we're, we're going to engage with city council in a very serious way on this question. It's, so there's two tensions, the, 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 the desire to resolve this and enact a plan for November but also the need to make sure that we understand uh, what voters are valuing now in an environment of 20% unemployment and evaporated 401k savings. That's a different world. And I guess if I would err, I would wanna err on the side of taking the time to get this right. So I don't know what that means. Is that, you know, what, is that decision coming in a month or I, I, I just don't know. But I, I honestly don't know. I want to take the time to get it right and make sure that we have meaningful conversations with council, 
with our stakeholders and with the citizens. Um, and so that's how I would answer that. Well, I, obviously we'll keep you updated, um, but we have to learn, um, we have to learn from what happened and understand that what citizens valued even two months ago might not be what they value anymore. Not that they don't want their roads to be fixed, I'm sure they do. But maybe now, if, if you know, we're heading toward what some people think may be the second Great Depression, you know, maybe something even as, as desired as fixed roads just isn't a priority right now. We need to take the time to understand that and to get it right. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, your time. Sean, if you can let me know how to get that coffee to Melissa, I will. I want to make good on my promises, and uh, and I hope you all stay healthy and uh, safe uh, during these upcoming days. And I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Thank you very much.